Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you a very warm welcome to the Montesquieu de Princes Lezing, organized in cooperation with the Europe Lecture. My name is Casper van der Berg. I teach EU governance at the University of Leiden here in The Hague, and I'll be moderating this program for you this afternoon. We are honored to be in such distinguished company today. Caroline de Gruyter, Europe correspondent at the Dutch newspaper NRC, and Paul Scheffer, who is professor in European studies at Tilburg University. Thank you for joining us and for your willingness to enlighten us with your views on the present state of Europe. <laughs> Members of the international courts, the various embassies, and the students who are here, it is wonderful to have you with us. And many thanks, to, many thanks to all other esteemed guests for being in this room today. The Europe Lecture Foundation frequently organizes lectures about Europe, about the impact of, uh, of, the, uh, of the European Union on many aspects of our society. That's also the purpose of this lecture today. And this lecture takes place in the context of the Princess Festival, the Princess Festival, a week-long festival in celebration of democracy. The theme of the Princess Festival this year is time to find each other, polarization and pacification between 1917 and 2017. Because the year 2017 is the centennial celebration of pacification in Dutch politics, the end of the decades-long struggle over suffrage and the school struggle in the late 19th and early 20th century. Precisely 100 years ago, a very long political debate in Dutch politics took place about school funding and voting powers for the broader population. Thanks to the pacification of 1917, a long struggle between the different political factions, split by religion and by ideology, came to an end, leading to the equal financial support for public and faith-based schools, general and general elections for the entire male population, and proportional representation in Parliament. A polarized debate made way for a pacified way forward. And the politics of pacification, or accommodation, as Adam Leipart called it, strongly contributed to our political stability and economic prosperity throughout the 20th century. But how strongly does the concept of pacification resonate today? The European Union's motto, United in Diversity, suggests pacification with respect for diverging identities and minority interests. But these days, many people feel far from united with their fellow Europeans. A shared European identity, as little as it exists, often clashes with national sentiments and different ideas about values and culture. Does diversity really lead to a sense of unity, or are we overestimating the potential of diversity as a means to bind groups together. Could it be that in trying to pacify the many diversities Europe knows, we are unintentionally creating more polarization? This is the core issue that will be addressed in the next hour and a half. First, Paul Scheffer will take the floor, followed by Caroline de Gruyter, and after that, there will be room for your questions and discussion here in the room. Having said that, I would like now to hand the floor over to our first speaker of today, Paul Scheffer. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to share with you some uh, thoughts about uh, the state of this union. I've been uh, listening to Jean-Claude Juncker uh, very carefully, but my state of this union would certainly begin with Brexit. The momentous decision in the United Kingdom on June 23 of last year to leave the European Union. If only because more than a year after the event, the first serious research into what has happened is published. Especially the book of Harold Clark and Matthew Goodwin, Brexit, Why Britain Voted to Leave the European Union. It's based on extensive investigation into members of the UK, the motives of voters at large. Just one finding to start with. The vote was decided by a relatively small margin, 
for leave, roughly 48 for remain. But they calculated that in no less than 64% of constituencies, if you would use the British electoral system, in 46, in 64% of constituencies, four and one out of 632, there were leave majorities. They also show that one year after Brexit, there is still the same majority among the public for leaving the UK, despite the lack of orientation <coughs> of the government. But more important, their research shows what the motivations were for Brexit. And they summarized their findings in the following way. Although arguments about how exiting the EU would help to re-establish national sovereignty and invigorate democracy were prominent themes in the Leave campaign, our analysis indicates that strong public concern over the large number of migrants <coughs> entering the country was front and centre to Leave securing victory. Of course, that public uh, awareness of migration reflected real changes in uh, the migration pattern into the UK. 2015 was a record year with net migration of 336,000 people. And what might be surprising, they had for the first time access to the members of UKIP. They were allowed to interview them and to interrogate them. And they did so on a large scale. And the attitudes of the rank and file when it comes to migration were representative of public at large. UKIP was not an outlier, it was the party that represented the best, the overall sentiment in Britain vis-a-vis -vis migration. Their conclusion, <coughs> our survey data, clearly showed that UKIPers' feelings towards various minorities are virtually identical to those expressed by a representative national sample of the general public. So that is something to chew on, because it reveals perhaps that um, UKIP was, in that way, more mainstream than perhaps Conservatives and Labour. Even more important, this research shows that the economic argument was won by Cameron in the Remain campaign. Most people accepted, also being interviewed after Brexit, the argument that in terms of economic costs and benefits, Brexit would bring considerably considerable costs with it. But that appeared not to have been the most urgent question on their mind. The analysis suggests that judgments about migration exert stronger effects than a reaction to economic conditions. It's not the economy, stupid, or certainly it's not only the economy. And everybody who has tried to reflect upon what societies are should understand that society is always more than a set of material conditions, it's also a symbolic or an imagined community. And that is why perhaps questions of immigration are felt so passionate by large majorities of the electorate. Finally, what is perhaps one of the most interesting lessons of the Brexit campaign is that the Remain campaign was in the eyes of the general public, again interviewed in a very sophisticated way after Brexit, their view of the Leave campaign was that it was the most negative, most, no, that their view of the Remain campaign that was the most negative campaign, what was later labeled as Project Fear, basically repeating uh, by, the, by Cameron and others that Brexit would mean severe recession on a short notice and all that. It was seen as more negative than the hopeful slogans, although that hope might be construed as rather fanciful, but nevertheless was seen as more hopeful argument about global Britain mending its own affairs in the wider world. And that is a lesson to learn, that this campaign, that hope, also what the Times in the editorial that I saw it, it, during the Brexit campaign said, hope was on the side of leave, while experience, but definitely also mobilizing fear, was on the side of Remain. And when people argue that populism is all about fear, they should contemplate for a moment that at least during this Brexit campaign, fear was mobilized on all sides, and definitely in the eyes of the wider public, more so 
by the Remain campaign and by those who wanted to leave. My first conclusion is that the incapacity to come up with an immigration policy in the EU vis-à-vis -vis migrants from outside the Union, but also vis-à-vis -vis migrants from inside the Union, was what decided Brexit in the end. To be entirely clear, without the unresolved immigration question, Brexit would not have happened. Britain would still be a member of the European Union. And Britain is certainly, in its attitudes towards migration, if you look at the Europe, Europe uh, Social Survey and other um, um, uh, research being done about attitudes in Europe, Britain is certainly not an outlier among the 28 nations uh, of the European Union. On the contrary, it occupies a position somewhere in the middle between, on the one hand, Germany and Sweden, being most open to immigration, and Hungary and Poland on the other hand. Take back control. And migration is the most visible aspect of globalization. And if it's deemed to be out of control, I think it's undermining the space for welcoming <coughs> newcomers. And it definitely was the deciding factor in Brexit. Second observation is that Brexit fits in a pattern of what could be described as a failed convergence in the recent history of European integration. The Union, and it was already referred to in the, the opening statements, is an experiment, and in many ways it was a successful experiment in pacification. It is built on the expectation that continuous cooperation and negotiation, a common legal and regulatory framework, will gradually lead forms of convergence economically but also culturally and socially. Convergence, by the way, not towards an undefined middle ground, but basically towards the West European standard. Of course, the question is whether this is a realistic expectation and whether this convergence is happening or whether we see divergence. When we concentrate on the two big initiatives that were introduced after the end of the Cold War, Abolishing national currencies introduced in the euro and abolishing national borders, Schengen, which was of course a momentous decision. It was strange that it was not in Versailles, that it was celebrated in Schengen, a sort of sleepy town, cross border town, in the middle of basically nowhere, <coughs> understating the momentous decision of opening borders. But if we look at those two big initiatives, abolishing national currencies and abolishing national borders, has it led to more convergence in Europe or to more divergence and conflict? <coughs> Let us briefly look at the Euro. We all know that it was primarily motivated by political considerations. More specifically, it was the price that Germany had to pay for reunification. It was seen at the time, in the 90s, a very optimistic time, full of economic growth, as a way to prevent Germany to become too powerful in Europe, which, of course, had the unintended consequence that Germany is now in a more central position than ever, and thereby also in a more vulnerable position than ever before. I think few people would dismiss the hard conclusion of Joseph Stiglitz, the famous economist, in his book about the Euro. The Euro has failed to achieve either of its two principal goals of prosperity and political integration. These goals are now more distant than they were before the creation of the Eurozone. And the Eurozone's performance on all accounts has been worse than those countries in Europe that do not belong to the Eurozone and worse than the United States. By 2015, non-Eurozone Europe had a GDP of 8.1% higher than in 2007 in comparison to the 0.6 increase within the Eurozone. Of course, you can say after a lost decade, but the decade is really lost. It's not going to be recovered. And all those young people who are unemployed are not going to find easily a way into the labor market again. There is really something lost. The price of the euro was indeed very high. But after this lost decade, you could say we are returning to the path of growth. You see how stable it is. But most important, the promise of convergence has until this moment not materialized in the halfway house that the euro still is. On the contrary, we've seen a growing divergence with all the political consequences. The euro has created a Europe with more resentment between North and South than before. Once more, the conclusion of Stiglitz's analysis, the most disturbing aspect of the eurozone's divergence, some countries, most notably Germany, have increasingly become predator countries, 
some debtors. This creates a divergence in economic interests and perspectives. The other great symbol of post-1989 Europe, abolishing internal borders, has also not created the convergence that was hoped for. It was a courageous and civilized idea, originated in 1985, but effective after 1995, also in the optimistic period after the end of the Cold War, when questions of territory, borders, and security appear to have evaporated with the disintegration of the Warsaw Pact. Of course, 25 year, years later, we awake in a very different world, where Europe is surrounded by violent conflict in the former Soviet Union, the Middle East, and Northern Africa, with all the refugee and migration movements that result from it. Open societies, we now discover, cannot develop without borders in an illiberal environment where authoritarian leaders like Erdogan, Assad, Putin, or Sisi have emerged. These borders need not to be national. They can be European, but then the European Union should develop its own strategy of protection, its own awareness that after abolishing an internal border, we now share an external border. But look only at the investment in Frontex, which has been rather a marginal affair. It has been an historic mistake to abolish national borders without understanding that Europe, by definition, then has to become an area of security and protection, just as it has been an historic mistake to create the Euro the way it was created. My second conclusion is that the promise of convergence has not materialized when it comes to the two major initiatives in post-Cold War Europe. The end of the national currencies has created a more divided Europe along the lines of north versus south, the end of national borders has contributed to a more divided Europe between east and west. This state of affairs is not a fatality, but we should question the rationality of these initiatives and at least the review a period, the 90s, that could be characterized with hindsight as overly optimistic and certainly quite naive when it comes to economic and security prospects. Europe has not converged to a West European standard, and it's not likely that it will do so in the upcoming decade. Third observation. How then should we understand the rise of populism against this background of two historic mistakes? <clears throat> Definitely, it is not a European phenomenon, populism. It should tell us something that in this Anglo-Saxon world, Populism first gained a majority, and not in continental Europe. I can remember speaking about all these questions quite often in Britain, or giving speeches in the United States, and then you were always met with a sort of condescending attitude. Well, we see all demons coming back on the European continent, but we are immunized against all that. We are immigration societies, we're open, we're the front bearers of globalization. Well, the reality now is a bit more <coughs> stubborn and complicated. The last elections in May 2014 to the European Parliament are a pointing case. 30% to Eurosceptic parties. True, you could argue, 70% still to parties that have a more benign view of Europe. But I want to challenge the overly optimistic and also deeply problematic view that I heard at an international conference, the Bilderberg Conference, shortly after these elections. A European Commissioner, there said, well, 30% makes the noise, 70% continues to make the laws. I thought it was deeply disturbing because, of course, before Brexit, before Trump, but I thought, how could you possibly know that 30% will always remain a minority? And by the way, haven't we learned that in democracies, it's all about listening also to the voice of minorities? So let us look at the 30%, the bewildering diversity from UKIP to the Front National, from the FPO to Syriza, from Jobbik to the movement of Grillo. All are summarized under anti-establishment or populist. What I like to suggest is that these parties, in varying degrees, are a genuine expression of discontent and that they are part of the self-correcting mechanism of a living democracy. For sure, raw, sometimes xenophobic sentiments are to be heard, but these populist parties reveal and represent the social and cultural divide in our societies that we should take seriously.
For lack of a better word, we refer to such movements as populist. But it would be far better to describe them as protectionist. If there has been one resounding cry in Europe over the last few years, there has been a call for protection. The first aspect of this populism is what you could describe as social protectionism, more historically part of the left-wing tradition in politics. The fear that the welfare state is being dismantled by the new liberal policies that produce unemployment and put middle class under pressure. We see this mainly in southern Europe, where parties like Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain use well-founded arguments to resist the straitjacket of austerity measures that are necessary to save the euro. But it's also a matter of cultural protectionism, not only social protectionism, also cultural protectionism historically more part of the right-wing tradition of policies. The idea that national identities are being undermined in a borderless world. We encounter these themes particularly in the north of Europe, where parties <coughs> such as the Danish People's Party, the Dutch Freedom Parties, have been gaining popularity. These parties resist immigration, which is partly the consequence of free movement of people within Europe. They too have arguments, although many of them quite exaggerated, bordering on the hysterical when it's about the Islamization of Europe, as we speak today, two attacks, one in London, one in Paris again. Gilles Kershoven, who is responsible for counterterrorism in the European Union, speaks about 50,000 jihadists being part of our society, which of course is a nightmare for all security um, services. We tend to think that it's a new normal now and then an attack, but I'm sure that something is completely unhinged about this all in our public uh, sphere. The political spectrum is splitting along a new fault line, internationalism versus protectionism. Should this fault line divide politics in the long term and the union as it functions today is reinforcing this new dividing line in uh, Europe, then there is a real risk that a majority of voters will ultimately come together around an illiberal idea of national unity, national identity. Protectionism in politics is a natural expression of a society in which the majority of citizens are not particularly mobile. So in my view, populism, understood as protectionism, reveals something more profound about the fact that the majority of citizens is in terms of employment, in terms of marriage, in terms of identification, far more in terms of geography confined than images of people on the move uh, confer to us. Anyone who wishes to understand the Front National in France should begin with a simple statistic that I saw in Le Monde. Seven out of ten French people still live in the region where they were born. So we're far less mobile than we think. And that is why I think these new parties that express forms of social and cultural protectionism um, are not going to go away easily. So my third conclusion is, if we understand populism as a form of protectionism, we understand the rational core of this movement in politics. There are certainly also irrational motives in supply to this populism. As we saw during the Brexit campaign, mobilizing fear is happening at least on all sides. And during the Brexit campaign, certainly more on the Remain side than on the Leave side. And who would want to maintain that the euro, in its present form, was a rational <coughs> economic idea? In short, if those with a liberal inclination do not understand that the core of this protectionism is rational, should be answered, then we will witness the emergence of illiberal majorities in our societies. My last remark is where should we go from here? The tragedy of the European Union according to former member of the European Parliament, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, is that many people feel it offers them no protection. Erwin van Rompuy referred to this when accepting the Charlemagne Prize. Europe, the great opener of opportunities, is now perceived by many as an unwelcome intruder. The threat of freedom in space is seen as a threat to protection and place. We need to restore the balance. It's essential for the Union to be on the side of protection. The Union, in my words, 
needs to start to see itself more as a product protective union allowing Europe to pursue its own social project in a growing world disorder. Understanding this need for protection means that in some areas Europe should limit itself if you want less Europe. And the big question being there is, is the Euro viable? I think it's a profound question. I'm not going to answer it today. I'm really struggling with answering this question. If only because I see what is needed, a transfer union will be fiercely resisted in part of the Eurozone, <coughs> and it will not help the South <coughs> to reform. But when I was speaking to the president of the Dutch uh, bank, and we were talking about Italy, and uh, I said, Italy is a very rich country, but only they had an effective taxing system. You know, they would really be in a very good position. And I said, well, how long are they already discussing this? An effective taxing system, I said, about 150 years. <laughs> so the question is, of course, what sort of reform, given that, that Europe is not easily converging to the Protestant Northwest European norm. What form of real convergence can we imagine, and what is the price to be paid to maintain the euro? But this is a big open question. But I want to concentrate on something else because if you want a Europe that protects, you also need more Europe. I don't want to be caught into the sterile <coughs> argument of less and more Europe. Because really answering those questions that are put forward by populist movements in our democracies, and if those questions are understood as questions about protection, then we need more Europe in certain areas. Because the national states cannot answer these questions of protection <coughs> on their own. So I began with Brexit. It could have been avoided if the Union would have had a consistent policy with regard to migration from outside, but also from within the Union. Let me be clear, there are many people who think that the refugee crisis of 2015 was an incident. But it must be entirely clear that the migration and the refugee crisis will haunt us in the coming decades. Demographic developments, population, just to give one example, of sub-Saharan Africa will more than double in the next 30 years, 1.2 billion people more than is now case in one of the poorest areas in the world. Climate change will provoke massive upheaval. Most estimates, will, although they are very unreliable, talk about 200 million migrants at least, so the number, total number of international migrants we have today. The global inequality between North and South, the political crisis and civil war that we see in many areas around us, and last but not least, chain migration, the fact that migration and diasporas contribute as a multiplier to migration. All these factors together means that it's not an overestimation to say that the migration and refugee crisis will be with us in the coming decades. My final conclusion is that the Union cannot become a community of values unless it becomes a community of security. It should take the need for protection very seriously. If Europe is not an answer to the problematic aspects of globalization, but is reinforcing the idea that globalization means that the world is out of control, and you hear this repeated over and over again, for example, when it comes to migration, migrants will come either legally or illegally, borders have no meaning in the 21st century, if Europe is unable to come up with an alternative to that idea, globalization, that it's more or less a state of natural affairs, and that the problematic aspect of this globalization cannot be answered, then not the, Ill, the liberal imagination will lose against the illiberal answers that will draw borders, that will create a sense of protection. So Europe should come up with a far more engaged way of dealing with illegal migration, a combination of prevention and repression, like with all forms of illegality. But somehow we live with a moral confusion when it comes to illegal migration. We have difficulty in seeing that illegality is a form of illegality. Because somehow morally illegal migration is not entirely illegal. Well, it is. And if we want to create space for legal migration, we should fight against illegal migration in a much more 
engaged way than we do today, with employer sanctions, with border control, with agreements with the countries of origin, etc. And yes, also forms of prevention, but those are in the long run, forms of development, different trade relations, you can come with a whole catalog of measures. What is needed is a far more engaged way of dealing with illegal migration. And I'm not at all convinced that it cannot be done. Blair and Asnair proposed um, in the mid-90s already to do far more about illegal migration, and this was subverted, this idea, by France and Germany, who didn't want to do much more. So a more strict approach to illegal migration will help ease tensions surrounding migration. As much as I'm convinced that defining the scope, let me be more clear, the limits of our humanitarian obligation towards refugees will help. Now the moral middle ground is destroyed by those advocating open borders, the idea of border control is something that is inhuman, and by those who are in favor of closed borders. We need to rediscover the moral middle ground, nor can we say that the needs inside of those inside of our borders are always more important than the needs of those outside our borders, but we cannot say the opposite as well, that the needs of those outside our borders always have preference over the needs of those inside our borders. It's a real moral dilemma. The European Union should do more in these areas, just as, a, as a example, an example, an important example of what Europe should become, that is to say, a sphere not only of freedom, but also of protection. If we are not able, and that is of course our great worry today, if the tensions in Europe are preventing to develop in that direction, then I'm sure that we will see a renationalization of borders with all the economic consequences that it will bring. The same is true for internal migration in the Union. In monetary affairs, we have created escape routes for countries with specific problems. Why not create those exemptions? for countries that have specific problems with internal migration in the Union. A sensible compromise is needed. We should have given Britain more space to formulate its own migration policy, then Britain would have still been inside of this Union. But why is it needed? Not only as a gesture toward Britain, because the same questions are asked throughout Europe. In creating better conditions in terms of upholding the social contract, <coughs> not allowing migrants to work under different conditions, what uh, Asher and others are trying to achieve, Macron has adopted this also, is part of the solution. But when migration in Europe becomes a problem in a specific country, it should have a possibility to react in a flexible way. Because the inflexibility in which Europe reacted to British demands has led to the Brexit. The price of Brexit is simply far too high. I hope that Europe will develop um, in terms that I described, that it will be a real attempt at convergence, at least in terms of also creating this zone of um, uh, security and protection. What is going on is distinctly not a fatality. It's a distinct possibility that Europe will be able to find the cohesion, the political consensus to come up with these sort of answers. That is why I begin my state of this union with Brexit, and I will end it there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schaeffer. You uh, started off by saying you would give us something to chew on, and I think uh, in many ways you have, uh, you have completely delivered on that. Uh, I have no doubt there are uh, many questions, many remarks also uh, here in the, in the audience, but we're holding them up for a moment because first I would like to give the floor to our second deliverer of the Europe Lecture this year, Ms. Caroline Gaat. Ladies and gentlemen, wonderful to see you all. 
here today, and so many of you even standing just like me, <laughs> just like Hans Pfeffer. Um, it's a great, great pleasure for me to be talking to you uh, about this year's Prince's theme, Polarization and Pacification. For me, this goes straight into the heart of the European matter. Polarization and pacification tend to go together. Europe is my field of work. The European Union is a peace project. It was, and it still is today, an attempt to pacify European nation states with clashing interests and clashing ambitions. Those clashes have, as we all know, in the past repeatedly gotten out of hand militarily. I often hear people these days complain, <coughs> complain about the EU. See, they say, we have the EU and now the North and the South are at loggerheads. <coughs> everybody is disagreeing with everybody. It's East against West, it's North against South, the Euro is not working, Visegrad is drifting off, and so forth and so on. That's right. Day in, day out, European countries clash with one another on a wide range of different subjects. They have different interests, different hang-ups, different ambitions, different industries, and different taboos. And so, they will always clash. They used to fight this out with guns, and now they fight with words. I think this is progress. I've spent 10 years in Brussels, in total, describing these verbal fights in Brussels. Not just about refugees or different visions of the euro, do you want to know how long they fought about the so-called breakfast directive? Do you know what that is, the breakfast directive? They try to come up with a precise definition of what can be labeled, for instance, muesli. And how much sugar or nuts, 100 grams of all this is allowed to contain. So that, on the internal market, every producer from all the corners of Europe can compete with others from other member states, freely and fairly. Well, it took them years. Several member states produce sugar. Others have raisins. Yet others, big cereal companies. Diplomats, and a few of them are here, this afternoon, they fought over this like stray cats. <laughs> About two grams of this and half a gram of that. Do you want another example? <laughs> it took them decades to agree on a European patent. They all wanted that patent, of course. It's great to be able to file a request in one country and have that request automatically recognized in all EU member states instead of applying in each country, one after another, each time in a different language and of course for a whopping fee. So everybody agreed on the principle. A European patent would be great progress. <coughs> Still, it took them a generation or more to conclude it. And still not everybody is on board. Why? Because of a dispute about language. The language in which the patent is eventually used. They chose three languages. But some countries still cannot accept that their language will not be used. <coughs> I could go on and on like this 
I will not, don't worry. My point is that conflict and polarization, alas, are a given in Europe, even after so many years of peace on our continent. And this is why we still need some kind of mechanism, a structure, to contain these forces, to make sure that the conflicts are fought out verbally and not, again, with guns. Some people assume European nation states and peoples, they can live happily together without this structure. They think there can't be war again. I think this is an illusion. It's dangerously naive. I've seen those coming games in Brussels. I've smelt the adrenaline, the raw emotions, and the sarcasm of the foot soldiers in the corridors. Of course, they were smartly dressed in suits and ties, but still, they're foot soldiers on a mission to defeat another country's banks, coal industry, and chicken farms. I cannot think of a better raison d'être of the EU, or whatever it is, that structure, than this. Not to suppress these emotions, but to contain them and to modify them. At school, I used to learn that Europe is all about trade, about economic cooperation with some of our neighbors. Oh yes, and in the later textbooks they said, some of us share a common currency too. It's high time in my view that we start teaching our children that the EU is a political project. That it is basically all about, yes, polarization and pacification to this very day. If you want to understand Europe's troubles, it is essential to know what the EU is about and what it is not about. As long as our school books give priority to NATO and transatlantic relations, treating European cooperation as an economic afterthought, Dutch citizens will never understand what our country is doing here in, right in the heart of Europe. Why we are so active in the EU, why we are in Schengen, why we have the Euro, and why we are participating in every single project that the European Union is undertaking. It's politics, stupid. <laughs> Nowadays, I think the biggest challenge is not what to do with the new member states, the new member states. It's not the euro. It's not even the economy, which anyway seems to be picking up. And it is not Brexit either. I think the biggest challenge is to come to terms with globalization. Let me take you back a couple of years. I'm sitting on the couch with my father. Must have been around 1980. We are watching television. It's election time. Just like many of my class classmates, I had a little broken gun on my home knitted jumper. Probably just to annoy my father. Anyway, we're on opposite sides. And we have a real fight about politics. In those days, lots of people had that fight. In those days, there was a big difference between the left and the right. Socially and economically, they advocated totally different policies for the country. And it made a huge difference whether the VVD or the Pevanda, the right or the left, one of the elections. One would lower taxes and increase social, uh, reduce social spending, and the other would do the reverse. In those days, 
you had that room for maneuver. This was the same in all European countries. Sovereignty had real meaning in those days. Remember François Mitterrand when he became president in 1981? He started nationalizing everything. This would be unthinkable today. Nowadays, the difference between right and the left has almost evaporated. Tony Blair, a labor man, has liberalized and privatized more than Margaret Thatcher has. The Greeks wanted different policies and voted Syriza. But Syriza continues the policies of, his conservative, of the previous conservative government. Greece is in the Eurozone out of its free will. Different policies would have meant an exit from the Eurozone and guaranteed pariah status for the next decade or two. Another example, Poland wanted to change its pension system a couple of years ago. The plan was killed in the end, but not by the Polish opposition, although they tried, but by PIMCO in the United States, the financiers. PIMCO said, if you go ahead with this plan, we'll pull out of the country. By globalizing, we have taken the economy out of national politics. We've simply taken it to a higher level. This means you can still talk about it, or fight about it, in the parliament, in cafes, or like my father and me, at home on the couch. But these discussions have only limited impact on policies these days. People vote Syriza, they get different ministers, but not different policies. So, they start complaining that democracy doesn't work. Whatever they vote for, whoever they vote for, it doesn't have an impact any longer. They feel, rightly, that they've lost control somehow. Power has slipped away. They ask, what is democracy worth? What is it for? It makes many of them frustrated and angry. Some turn their back on politics and don't vote any longer. And others start hating all politicians and vote them down whenever they can. The main battle the citizens in Europe are facing, are waging, centers on this. During the Euro crisis, I once witnessed a discussion in the offices of a think tank in Brussels. I will never forget it. It was around the lunchtime. There were about 20 people sitting around a large oval table with all, all kinds of plates with sandwiches on them. We were looking out over the park where I remember the autumn wind chased the last leaves of the trees. Suddenly, the door opened. Four young men in jeans entered. They were indignados, <coughs> young activists who were camping out uh, in several parks in Europe for weeks, protesting against neoliberal <coughs> policies and the multi-billion bailouts of the banks in Europe and America. This is not a society that we want, one of them said. He was a young man studying at the Sorbonne. Like the other three, he was eloquent, well-educated, polite, and serious. Nice guys. I will never forget this session. The young man had not had a shower in a row, and they brought a horrible smell with him. And they hadn't had that much to eat either, because they immediately started pocketing all the sandwiches on the table. <laughs> For our comrades in the park, one of them said, as a sort of an apology. But the most impressive moment came when they'd finished criticizing the capitalist system and its excesses. Many in the audience, by the way, sympathized. Then it was the turn of the system to answer. A direct 
Director General in the European Commission stood up. The casting could not have been better. He was grey-haired, a bit balding, a little on the heavy side, <laughs> and wore a very good suit. He was Dutch, by the way. <laughs> and he said, you want me to provide for an answer? It makes me feel like a turkey at Thanksgiving. You, you expect me to defend the system? Well, I won't. He explained he had been involved with the 1968 protests. <coughs> this had also been, of course, a fight against the system. He said he sympathized with the indignados. He said they had, they had good points. So the only thing he wanted to do was to give them a piece of good advice. Go into politics. Get involved. Change the system from the inside. That's what we did. Look where we ended up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stay out, because your influence will be zero. I am making this little detour because, in my view, it sums up the biggest dilemma that we have nowadays in Europe. We have a democratic political system. And still, citizens feel utterly powerless. Democracy is national. The economy is, in large part, international. It is this mismatch that causes trouble. And we should take it seriously. Because people start questioning the value of democracy itself. But there's a second important side effect of this process of globalization. What happens when you take the economy out of the national debate? What are you left with? You're left with the soft issues. Issues that you can still decide upon at the national level. Euthanasia, integration, abortion, the burqa. <coughs> All of these issues touch on identity, religion, and values. They are polarizing issues. When you discuss the economy, lots of facts and figures are involved. It's relatively easy to compromise. It's relatively easy to be good friends after having had a fierce political argument, like me and my father at the time on our couch. The next morning we had a good laugh over breakfast. But it is hard to compromise on these soft issues. The more you make your point, the more you insult others. The more you discuss them, the angrier everybody gets. Remember this poisonous Silvana discussion, spinning out of control? You see that in many European countries. Back to Europe again. To polarization versus pacification. The question is, how do we give politics more meaning in such a way that citizens feel that they have a say and a stake? The most radical remedy would, to, would be to bring the economy and the democracy back on the same level. That would mean either, if you follow this logic, either renationalizing the economy or internationalizing parts of democracy. I'm not sure there's a lot of appetite for either at the moment. Globalization is like a plane that we put in motion ourselves, by the way, and we're in that plane. Pascal Lamy, the former chief of the WTO, once said, it's stupid to jump out in mid-flight because the plane, that is global globalization, uh, will go on without us. The UK is now experiencing this. Taking back sovereignty, if you do it solo and so radically, is a brilliant way to shoot yourself in the foot. Internationalizing democracy is maybe more interesting. 
Is the Eurozone undemocratic? Well, let's give her a parliament. Let's give her a new parliament, or let's do it via the European Parliament, but let's try. But this can only work, such a parliament, if citizens finally get active and learn about Europe and its workings. I keep coming back to this point. If you want to get involved and help shape the future, you need to know where to go and what to do. It would be great if a country like the Netherlands, in the heart of Europe, would help its citizens with that discovery. The future of this country is intimately connected with the future of the European project. If Europe needs a vision, it is also the member states that have to help her to get there. Some countries are trying to formulate new common policies now, especially after Brexit. There's a new momentum. It's good news, in my view, that France and Germany, who form the most important pillar of the European Union, are finally discussing this again. Of course, they never agree on anything. But this is precisely the point. Germany has been locked up in the north, and France has been locked up in the south for almost a decade now. Nothing moved because they only emphasized their differences. They polarized. Now, Paris and Berlin are focusing again on what unites them, or what could or should unite them. They try to develop some kind of vision for the next decades. They pacify. For the Netherlands, utterly dependent on Europe, this is a double-edged sword. We often feel squeezed between France and Germany. That's why, that's why one of the reasons why we like to follow the UK. It was an ideal counterbalance against those two. I'm saying was, because the UK will be out. The Dutch stakes are now all on the continent, just like the stakes of the Czechs and the Danes, for example, who have long, also long hidden behind the broad Eurosceptic backs of the British. If we want to help shape the future of Europe, we have to be right there. The Dutch Prime Minister can maintain that those who try to develop a vision for Europe must see an eye doctor. <coughs> but this attitude will not do any of it. And I think he knows it. The country will have to become more European. Europe will move because everything around us is moving too. Paris and Berlin will not wait for us. It's time to slowly prepare citizens for this, to give them a little bit more information about what exactly our ministers are doing in Brussels. Did you know, for instance, that two-thirds of all decisions there are taken by unanimity? By unanimity means all member states approve. It's time to start correcting this idea of the faraway bureaucracy, bureaucracy, taking decisions far above our heads. No, it's not just bureaucrats patronizing us, but often it's rather our own ministers. Let me wrap up now. Let me wrap up by saying that I think that in one year, the mood in Europe has shifted immensely. A year ago, all was gloom and doom. Everybody seemed convinced the EU would be torn to pieces. Well, she is still there. Battered, not very pretty, as usual, but stronger nevertheless. Extremists in several countries didn't even come close to win elections. Constructive parties and politicians have won instead. Everywhere I see interesting experiments going on by groups, movements and parties
trying to give democracy a new start. Students in Germany and Switzerland refuse to sit in their, on their hands any longer, complaining that nothing works, and they get politically active. People start waving European flags all of a sudden in over a hundred European cities. Here in The Hague, little discussion groups about Europe spontaneously sprang up in private living rooms, organized via Facebook. In Vienna, where I used to live, the same thing would happen. After the success of free roaming, young activists from all over Europe are seizing the possibility of so-called citizens' initiatives to put issues on the European agenda. There are zillions of big and small examples of this, and I can tell you they were not there 10 years ago. Some will fail, some may get somewhere, but perhaps that is the best thing of this political crisis. People realize that most of us never had it so good, and that if we want to defend this, we have to get up and do something. If we need reform, well, let's try to bring it on. I will close with this wonderful saying by Edmund Burke, the Irish politician and philosopher, who said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, for good men to do nothing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Caroline Gruyter, for your uh, also thought-provoking uh, uh, comments uh, this afternoon. I think if I uh, if I take the liberty to make a uh, a very uh, preliminary analysis of the two stories, what is what uh, it, it almost uh, comparing the two viewpoints is almost like uh, forms an hourglass where you have two very different starting points. In the middle of both your argumentation, you almost seem to come a little bit closer to one another, but then by the time we get to the future outlook, you are diverging uh, quite strongly again. Uh, I think this is a basis for uh, uh, for a good discussion here with the uh, with the audience, and I would like to invite. Uh, everybody here to uh, raise their hands if they want to uh, ask any question to one or both of our speakers today. And we will do this by means of uh, collecting a small number of questions per time and then um, put them before our two speakers. So please, anyone who would, um, who would like to uh, ask a question, raise their hands. I see two at the back already. Um, yes. So, maybe if you can uh, stand up, say who you are, and then ask your question in a concise way. Uh, I'm called Jan van Blankenstein. I uh, spent uh, much of my time in England. I went to school in England, and I worked in the Dutch Ministry of Social Affairs. And in this uh, context, I would suggest that perhaps the biggest mistake which was ever made by the EU was to let England in. Because, <laughs> because in, in the Ministry of Social Affairs, we noticed that the English were constantly sabotaging everything. And just to uh, suggest that the speech by, uh, was slightly deceptive on the migration, Migration was actually introduced in 1968. Migration for work and migration for free movement of, of, of tourists, etc., was only introduced in 89. But people could already move in 68. And for and and the, and the, the, the British, when the Poles became member, did not. Uh, uh, used the seven years uh, period for, to stop them like Germany and uh, Holland did. So it's... Hmm? The question is fairly clear. <laughs> Wasn't it the biggest mistake to let the UK into the 
you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm right behind you, the lady in blue or something. I'm Suzanne Keller, and as you've seen, I am a well-integrated ex-Hungarian. So I was listening to these lectures with huge interest. My question is uh, about uh, the European Parliament. Namely, I fully agree with the notion that politics should be internationalized. And my question to Mr. Krauter is, why do you think the European Parliament hasn't fulfilled this role yet? Thank you. Um, yes, and halfway into the room there's somebody else with a question. Here, one for now. Hello, my name is Ingrid and I'm from the UK. And I disagree with Paul in terms of uh, the whole Brexit question. Uh, I would put it to him that uh, the main problem with uh, Brexit was the fact that uh, Cameron actually promised to do it at all. If it wasn't migration, it would have been another reason. I think geography, uh, the British attitude, and the British press uh, attitude to uh, Europe as a whole were some of the main issues, rather than just migration. I think that the Brexiteers use migration for, and the fear of migration uh, as a lever. But the main problem was the question was always going to be a, a one-off if they won, because there was no way back. If you, uh, you could always promise, the Brexiteers could always promise a rosy future. All that the Remainers could promise was what they already had. And if you voted to leave, there was no way back. So David Cameron was the fault of all. There was no level playing field. And my question, well, my question is, <laughs> given that background, migration was actually not the, the main route of the UK Brexiting. It was rather, um, I think, the geography of, of Britain, Britain's attitude, uh, and David Cameron as a whole, because the, the question that was actually put to the, the public was, was wrong as well. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's take these three questions first and then do a second round. So there's three questions on the table. One is, uh, wasn't it a mistake to ever let the UK into, the, uh, into uh, the European project? The second one on the European Parliament and the third one on, the, uh, on how could Brexit uh, have happened. So um, please, uh, both our speakers, your reflections, if you will, on, uh, on either of these questions. <laughs> Um, well, if you go back to, to answer the first question, if you go back in the history of Dutch diplomacy, you will find that the Dutch were quite instrumental, more specifically, Foreign Minister Lunch, with his préable anglais. You know, the idea we want further integration in Europe on one condition that the UK will join this um, European community. So the Dutch were quite instrumental in insisting upon British entry into um, this community, although they knew, of course, that the British attitudes, which come from somewhere, geography definitely plays a role in history, but um, they knew, of course, what the role of Britain would be, and it perhaps expresses what you said as well, that the Dutch have been hiding between the Eurosceptic views of Britain for quite a long time, and now they have to choose. So, very complicated, but if it was a wrong decision, I'm not sure at all. I would still prefer a European Union with the British involved, because I think, you know, look only at the number of top 200 universities in Britain, more than 30. So Europe would be really foolish to think it can do without Britain. The British economy is quite important. Britain, in terms of defense, is uh, absolutely vital for the future of a union that wants to be a union that explores more in the field of security. So I don't think it was a mistake. I think it was a huge mistake not to think more clearly about the ways in which these differences in Europe could be accommodated. And then the question of immigration, well, I'm sorry. Uh, this is sophisticated research being done, you know, asking the people before, asking afterwards, 
um, all kinds of uh, statistics, I uh, uh, suggest you read the book, because they are very insistent from page one that the question of immigration was the trigger that transformed what was a minority, always there, one third of the population was always against, also in 75, voted against Britain inside of the Union, it was always there, so that is a part of geography, of longer traditions, but the inability of Britain, and of course, it was part of their own making, because they could have invoked in 2004, you know, a longer period of accommodating this new migration. Uh, it wasn't done, but it definitely, according to what most people in doing research now on why the practice happened, was definitely one of the most important questions there. And I'm quite sure, and Nigel Farage said it the other day in the European Parliament, when Europe would have offered Britain more of an accommodating view on migration within the EU, Brexit would never have happened. So, um, yes, I think it's one of the most important questions of our time. And Europe would stand or fail, not only in terms of Brexit, but also in other European countries, Europe would stand or fail in answering those questions which are the most visible part of a Europe that finds a way, you know, in a globalized world, because I do agree with you, that is the defining time, but also the defining challenge for Europe. Um, let, me, let me take the question of the European Parliament, does it work? Do you remember? And then come back to Brexit as well, because I'm, I have a slightly different view of that. Um, the, I think you're, you're right that the European Parliament is not it's functioning rather well, but in the, in the, in the view of citizens in Europe, uh, I mean, they don't even see it, huh? and they don't identify with it. And I think this is, uh, this is a, a good example of, um, of the, the, the um, how would I call it, um, a lot of issues that citizens care about have remained national in Europe. The quality of schools, uh, security and safety, uh, what are we doing in Iraq, for instance, all these things the European Parliament cannot decide upon. Often, they spend a long time on, on um, the breakfast directive and that kind of issues, statements about Myanmar that have no, uh, that have no political impact really. Um, it's, I think this makes it very hard for citizens to identify with it. Politics has largely remained national. This is, this is a very good example of, um, of the fact that this, it's, it's rather untenable, actually. Uh, on Brexit, um, whether uh, migration was the number one reason or not, uh, I think there are many reasons. I've spent 10 years in Brussels and I've seen the Brits slowly checking out. Uh, they used to be, on, on, on certain issues, they always, they had the best people always, who came to Brussels extremely well prepared. They trained their diplomats uh, for, for a job in Brussels. Uh, I mean, nobody did that better than they did, the Fast Streamers program. That program was scrapped a couple of years ago. This made the program was so good that if there were vacancies somewhere in the European system, the Brits would have uh, often the best candidate. <coughs> All these things, in, over the course of several years, uh, they put less energy in. And you saw them checking out. I heard from people, even in, in foreign policy working groups, in the Foreign Service, for instance, they would send not the director, but a lower level, and before they would come with clear proposals, they were very well prepared, and they could often, you know, uh, be very influential because of that. But all of a sudden, that started to diminish. So they had uh, no proposals ready, or they were not speaking at all, they were slowly checking out. And a British diplomat with a lot of uh, experience in, in Europe, he said, we always, we always like to play the mirror in the European Union. 
So we always ask the difficult questions, and it's true actually. But he said, we like this role so much that in the end we have become the mirror. We cannot get out of this role any longer, and I think this is more or less what happened. But do you suggest then that it was inevitable? I think it's inevitable. Yeah. I think it Afterwards, was everything so is inevitable. There's another, there's another thing that happened. The Brits and the Dutch were the main protagonists, the, the main supporters of the big enlargement in 2004. But with enlargement, the center of Europe has moved to the east. The center of Europe was Vienna, where I, where I had just lived for a couple of years. In other words, that made the Brits feel even more uh, on the periphery. They, they are more <coughs> in the periphery, even geographically, than, than ever before. I think we have, the, the EU has bent it over backwards to offer the UK a way out with the deal that they made up last year. I think they went quite far already and they could not compromise any further. What the British want, basically, is to, to keep the cherries and to do away with the cake. They want to stay on, in the European Union. They want to stay in, on the internal market without abiding by the rules, uh, without recognizing the role of the, uh, of the judges in Luxembourg, and so on. I mean, at a certain <coughs> point, you cannot compromise any further. And even the Eurosceptic countries like Denmark and the Netherlands, they, for them, I hear you sigh. <laughs> but for them, it will be, um, if they can, the Brits still seem to expect that, you know, our best friends in Europe, the Dutch or the Danes, they can help us out. Huh? They, can make, they can give us some kind of a nice deal. No, they cannot. If you, if you listen to the Danes and the Dutch in those kind of meetings, they all say, look, we really love to help you. And it will, it, it's, 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 it's going to hurt us all a lot when you leave. But the internal market for us and its underpinnings is the absolute priority. Now I'll ask you another question. If 4% is inevitable, 52 against 48, I think there's far more dynamics in this Brexit process linked to events like the refugee crisis and all that. But leave it apart. Now we go back to 1992. Still a smaller margin decided French acceptance or rejection of Maastricht. If 1% more in France would have voted against the Treaty of Maastricht, would you have said the same? That France was always on the way out? That it was inevitable that France would check out? No. So this 1%, which is really uh, very small margins, and much more linked also to the effectiveness of political leaders. I mean, Cameron is perhaps not in the best position to argue after being a Eurosceptic for so many years. Tony Blair would have had perhaps, without the Iraq war, done a much better job in this context. Who, who, who would have known? Uh, Jeremy Corbyn was, of course, the most horrible political leader labor in this context. So there were so many elements which decided this political dynamic, but I would suggest simply uh, that I think Europe on the whole is in a much better position with Britain in terms of defense, in terms of intellectual capacity, in terms of economic resilience, etc., than without. And I think it's very difficult to argue if the opposite is the case, why should the Dutch be, why should the Netherlands be in Europe? Europe is better without Britain. Why would it not be better without Britain? Maybe Britain is possible to go back to Europe. Yeah, yeah. I think Europe is about France and Germany, and it's not about the UK, first of all. During the last uh, 10 years, we've had crisis after crisis. We had, the, we had the banking crisis, we had the euro crisis, we had the migration crisis, the permanent state of crisis. During most of these crises, you had lots of uh, European council meetings, all-nighters, and so on. The Brits would sometimes not, be, not even be there. They're not in Schengen, they're not in the Euro, 
if you you mentioned uh, President Vaughan, uh, but he always says, and I think he was right, that during most of those meetings, if Cameron was present at all, he would not even speak. I think the UK is a little bit less vital in, in Europe than France is. All right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's let's um, uh, collect a couple more questions. I saw two hands raised, one here in front and one secondly uh, on the uh, side uh, in the middle there. Yes. Yeah, I think it was absolutely fascinating. I have one specific question uh, to, to uh, uh, post that. You made two comments to say the euro was a historic mistake and the border of Europe is a historic mistake. Uh, what would be the situation of Europe if these two historic mistakes are not been made? All right, thank you. And the second question, there, if you would like to stand up, yes. One of the previous speakers debunked her identity as a Hungarian. Uh, well, let me say, uh, if, if I mention my original name, it's Holiday Andras, I was born a Hungarian. Turned Austrian, became a British uh, academic, and uh, don't worry, I'm Dutch. <laughs> I have uh, one specific question to each of you. I uh, want for comment, but it will result in a question as it should be. Um, um, you know, Stefan, um, you ended by saying that uh, Europeans crave protection. And uh, I want to point out to you because. I have been as an amateur studying uh, European uh, history and the European Union for the past 20 years. The law, uh, he uh, wanted to pursue a European model of society. And what was in his way were the nation states, the members of the European Union, as it then was. Um, my, um, and incidentally, uh, the, the problems of Schengen and the problem the Eurozone, and also to a considerable extent, not as the result of badly sought out ideas, but of the resistance of nation states to uh, draw the consequences of what they themselves have uh, agreed to. Now, my question uh, to uh, Evelina Kreiter, with whom I have conversations in Vienna, um, is the following. You, you, you pointed out that there's a, a, a difference between democracy, which is national, and globalization, which the, by definition is not <coughs> European, but it's global. Um, now, democracy is being produced, and I use this term uh, deliberately, is being produced nationally. Yeah. So, again, we come back to the role of the nation states, um, on, on the one hand as members of the EU, on the other hand as constructs, and they are historic constructs, only a couple of centuries. Yeah. And uh, my question is, and it really relates to both, is it the real problem that we are facing? The construct of the nation state, which because it does not operate in this world anymore as it should, yeah. isn't the real issue how to develop a form of democracy that is not contained within the nation state, that somehow or other reacts to and responds to the problem, sorry to say, uh, res uh, responds to uh, the, uh, the, the real interaction which is taking place. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, these two questions, I think, uh, in which uh, both of you are addressed, uh, uh, we'd like to uh, you know, well, that's of course a question what Europe would have been without the Euro and uh, without opening the borders. When I qualify them as historic mistakes, I say in form in which they were uh, institutionalized. That is what I said explicitly, of course, because I said that the Euro is a halfway house. The way it was constructed is an historic mistake. And the same about borders. You cannot open borders without having functioning external border. So those are the mistakes that are made. Um, of course, it's interesting to ask the question, and many people are trying to do research on that, whether the euro contributed to growth. There's hardly any substantial evidence that the euro produced more growth in those countries joining the euro. 
there have been measurements, you know, of the economic growth before the euro, afterwards. Also, by the way, there have been a lot of research that's been done about economic growth before joining the European Union and afterwards. The effects are far less visible than we would like to think, and especially when it comes to the euro. It might be that the euro in its present form, I think we hardly disagree, has had very problematic effects, also in terms of the longer euro crisis, the longer it took to get out of the recession. So the performance of the non-euro zone is on the whole better than the eurozone in the last 10 years. That is something to reflect upon. Um, I'm not suggesting that by qualifying the way the euro came into being, I can very well remember, I was a member of the Commission advising, you know, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs on European um, integration at the time, and discussing with André Sass, who was uh, doing a lot of the negotiations, and he, we agreed completely that the euro in this form would not function, that it would so create within, within, within 10 years or 15 years a major crisis. Well, we're in the midst of it, and nobody can assure me that when Draghi says, I will do everything to save the euro. For some people, that is a reassuring thought. I'd like to know what the price will be in the end of saving the euro. That might be that what is seen by almost everybody now, that the way the euro was constructed was a historic mistake. Sometimes, by clinging to a historic mistake, you might even worsen the situation. For me, the question is really open whether can sustain the euro. People like Stiglitz and other highly qualified economists, far more than I, say that even when you would have a convergence in terms of deficits and that that structure of the European economies is so divergent that it would take a massive transfer union to redeem all those structural differences because the inflexibility when it comes to exchange rates, etc. Well, everybody knows the argument. The question is really open, in my view, but really open, whether the euro will prove to be sustainable or not. So in Europe, the next 10 years will, but I would say euro could have done without the euro very well. Open borders is a different question. That belongs, in my view, to the internal market. The economic rationality of the euro is basically, by all economists, is very much disputed. It was a political project. The question is, did we need that political project to integrate Germany into Europe. The question of open borders is much more linked to the functioning of the internal market. But there again, I would say, we will see the collapse of Schengen, and we almost saw it already, if we don't succeed in building a functioning common area of security. We will agree probably on that. But then again, if we, would, if we don't, um, if, we, if Europe proves to be unable to do that, and will stick in this halfway out, <coughs> also, when it comes to borders, then I'm really doubtful whether it will be seen in history as a very productive step. That is why, in its present form, I would qualify it as an historical mistake, the absence of urgency to, to open borders without understanding that Europe then as a whole would need a functioning external border. More should have done. Um, I'm slightly less pessimistic than you are of the euro. <laughs> I think it's a very political question. First of all, I wouldn't listen too much to uh, economists. Who, uh, I mean, if you put three of them in a room, you get five different opinions, and none of them, and none of them saw the, saw, saw the uh, financial crisis coming. To start with, but of course you have a point that if you eliminate, in fact, the euro problem and the Schengen problem are the same. You know, you do you eliminate borders, you erase borders, so you share a common a common currency or a, you know, a, a large piece of land. So you have to work on your defenses jointly, and we have not done that. I was there in Brussels, for instance when the um, when uh, Schengen was set up. And then, of course, the European Commission 
made all kinds of uh, proposals saying like we need a very strong border protection. We need a common asylum policy. We need legal immigration. We need all these kinds of things. And it was very interesting because all these proposals that are now back again on the table were shot down by whom? By the member states. So actually what you should be doing now is put a lot of pressure on, Dutch, on the Dutch government. Like, and now you hurry up and agree to those issues. Right? It was very funny. Uh, some time ago in Vienna, um, the former um, Chancellor Susan invited a, the deputy head of Frontex. There was this, a crowd like this, and they were all saying, and where is Frontex, you know, and now that we need you and Europe is not functioning. And Susan was sitting there and he didn't say anything. The Frontex man was quietly explaining, like, look, we had uh, a very small budget because member states don't want to spend money. So we had a small budget, which meant that we had, like, in the beginning, 30 people. How many, how many kilometers of border, external border do we have? Thirdly, they didn't have the power just to go and protect the borders uh, because they needed the permission of the, of the member state involved to get access at all. When uh, a lot of Syrian refugees started to arrive in, in Greece, for three months, the Greek government did not invite Frontex. They didn't let them in. So, and so the where, people, where, the people where in does the, audience, the, where does the optimism no, come but, from? But afterwards, <laughs> but afterwards, I said to Mr. Schüssel, why didn't you say anything? Because you were the one. Yeah. Austria was very, very vocal, as was the Netherlands, by the way, but very, very vocal against a strong Frontex. So you cannot just block it in Brussels and vote it down in Brussels and then come home and say, the EU is not working. But, but, but so, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking the question of who is to blame, because I completely agree that there's too much national divisions on all those questions. My question to you is when you say I'm rather optimist, I can see what is needed in Europe, but I also understand why we're stuck with the euro in a halfway house and why we're stuck when it comes to questions of defense and protection, also in a halfway house. The only thing I suggest is that when we keep on this halfway house for a longer time, then renationalization might be very difficult to avoid. That is my worry. It's not that I'm overly pessimistic, but I'm simply asking if we're already 25 years or 20 years in such halfway constructions because of all these differences of interest and positions. Is Europe able to construct a transfer union, and are we able then to make it function? Really, an important question, and I share your doubt about the economists, by the way, completely. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had a number of proposals, and we had a number of there and it is uh, at times rather strong um, globalization or not so I think it will be it will be extremely difficult to just pretend that the member states of the, of the EU of the nation states uh, are not there at the moment it, it's not going to work I'm afraid All right, I think given the time, uh, this is where we should uh, wrap up this afternoon. Uh, I wish to thank uh, both our speakers today, Paul Seffer and Caroline de Gruyter, for uh, uh, being with us and for sharing their uh, thoughtful and also thought-provoking ideas on Europe. And I think in doing so, you underlined two very important European values. One is the uh, need for pluralism of ideas. And secondly, it is the, uh, the necessity of an, uh, an ongoing open debate on this. So I want to thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. And, and on behalf of the uh, Europe Lecture Foundation and the Montesquieu Pages Lazing, I also want to thank you all very much for your attendance this afternoon. 
you, you have probably noticed that uh, um, uh, photos and videos have been made. They will be posted on the uh, websites of the organizing partners on Monday, if you're interested. And for more events hosted by the Princess Festival, please visit their website on www.princessfestival.nl. Thank you very much for coming here and have a great rest of your day.